I can see some people that say, yeah, they know. How many of you know about Oxford Nanopore? Perfect. Perfect. So it's going to be an easy class for you. Okay. So let's uh, go then to the class and let's start to put some um, some concepts. Okay. Perfect. So um, this is going to be the outline of this lesson. Again, this is going to be recorded. So at some point. If you feel that uh, yeah, is you need to do other things, just let me know. Again, remember that I need to ask for your presence of absence. So uh, all of you, please uh, write in the chat uh, when you can during this class uh, your name, uh, present, and then the timestamp. OK, and I will use again as a proof that you uh, attended the class. OK, you have the whole class to do it. Um, Perfect. If you have claimed your card to do that for you, it still would be fine. OK, so. Uh, as I said, I'm just going to record who is writing. Uh, I'm here. OK, just in, just in case that someone in the college asked me about uh, that. OK, so that is going to be uh, the uh, guidelines. The part that is more important here is going to be five, OK, about Common file format. The red is more or less informative. OK, so concept about genetics and you already know everything, but in case that you feel that you don't know anything of this, that would be a good reminder that you should know. So of course, genomics is a part of genetics and genetics is the brand of biology concerned about the study of genes, gene variation and heredity of organisms. Basically, genetics is. Uh, please, uh, for the people that is putting present, put also the 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 exactly time, okay, that you are being that. So that will have a rec a record of also the time, because otherwise, yeah, it's yeah, it will be that bad time. Okay, so as I said, genetics you will have um, two plants, for example, is the sign that you have two plants and you cross them. The phenotypes will segregate or will not segregate. So that will be an example of an F1. And then that will be an example of F2. And you can see the segregation of some genes. You already know that. So basically, genetics study the source of variation and also the mechanisms of inheritance. About the mechanisms of inheritance, and this is the classical uh, Mendelian genetics. I don't know what well, you know already. That Mendel in the, the last well, two centuries ago did this experiment of the law of inheritance in which he studied different traits for um, a pea plant. For all of you that you don't know, Mendel studied other plants, but the only one that uh, really fit in Mendel's law was uh, peas. Okay, so that is the curiosity here. And by the way, for all of you that you are doing a scientific career, okay, in science, just let me tell you a very funny fact about Mendel. Mendel probably has published one of the most influenced um, papers or articles in the whole history of biology. Of course, Mendel's law are essential for us. But you don't know, it's funny that during the first 20 years, he only received two citations. OK, no one knew about Mendel's work. Funny, the funny thing was that Mendel's work was uh, very well accepted in, especially in plant breeders, or the thing that was at that point starting as a, as a, as a breeding. But for the field of more basic science, Mendel's was kind of ignored for some time until start, people rediscovered Mendel's. OK? So it was kind of a funny thing. So you are worried about your career, you are not published good papers. You can say that now I'm following just Mendel's style. I will be famous, yeah, 50 years down. Okay. So um, so as I said, Mendel's law laws is uh, in some ways is giving you some insights about when you cross two plants in two cycles, that F1 and F2, 
how these segregation patterns work. And mostly you have three uh, laws that explain the segregation pattern. One of them is the law of dominance and uniformity. The other is law of segregation. And the last one is law of independent and sovereign. Law of dominance and uniformity means that you have a dominant allele and you cross with a recessive allele. The first generation of the cross always is going to have the dominant allele. So that is like in this case with red flowers. The law of segregation told you that if you take this first generation, first cross, the F1, and you cross with themselves again, then you will have a segregation of three to one from the dominant allele to the recessive. So in the case of red flowers and white flowers, you will have three red flowers, each white flower. Also, you can have two effects. You can have dominance and codominance. Dominance is when one of the alleles is dominance over the, over the other one. So you will have a segregation three to one. And codominance is when you have an intermediate phenotype between both alleles, that will be, for example, a pink flower. And then you will have a segregation of one to one without no one being preferential over another one. The last one is the law of independent assortments that alleles for separate clades are based independently one of another. Okay, so you have two independent clades that you are measuring. Like for example, in this example, uh, the color of the pot and the um, shape of the pots. So you have green or yellow, or then you have um, a state or, or not. So you will have wrinkle or, pain, or plain, sorry. You will have a three to one, three to one. The other thing that about the law of independent assortment is that works in most of the cases, except when you have linkage. So for some clades like purple red flowers and seed shape long and round, these two clades in peace are um, linkage. So you have some deviation of the Mendelian segregation, okay? The, com the terms of genetic linkage was uh, made by Batterson, Saunders, and Punnett after Mendel. Okay. Also, it's important to know alleles. Okay. Concept of allele is essential. And concept of allele is something that you already will be using in this class sometimes. So, allele is a variant form of a given gene. Okay. That is when you have one or more versions of that. So most of the individuals, when you have two set of chromosomes, they're deployed, you will have two alleles and you can have two states. So you have one allele and then you will have an homozygous state or you can have two alleles, one different for each copy, okay? And then you will have an heterozygous state. So this will be an example with the, the, the flowers that I put after, no? You have red, red, or you have white, white, you will have an homozygous state or you have red, white, depending if it's dominant or codominant, you will have the heterozygous state. This is some maths about it. And as I said, I will not go out into that. The last concept about genetics that I want to mention is genetic map, uh, genetic linkage and genetic maps. So genetic linkage is the tendency, okay, of DNA sequence to be close to each other and being enhanced together during the meiosis phase of sexual reproduction. So this is a good example. If you have two, uh, loci to genes in different chromosomes, they are not going to be linked at all. But if you have, they are close to each other in a chromosome, you need to have some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, break between these two to have a segregation between them, okay? Otherwise, always the two phenotypes are going to be together. So in this case, you, they are together, red flowers and big flowers, and the other phenotype is small white flowers, because you cannot break the linkage. The segregation always will have big red flowers or small white flowers, okay? As I said, this is something that you already know, so I'm not going to go into much detail there. And also remember that you have homologous recombination with chromosomes during the meiosis. That is when you can break this uh, linkage, okay? If you can perform a linkage analysis, you will have linkage groups and genetic maps. 
And of course, you can have genetic markers, and there are a very bunch of different genetic markers as you can see here in this list. And I'm not going to move into much of those. Okay. But just for your reference, a genetic marker is a gene or DNA sequence with a known location in a chromosome that can be used to identify individuals of species. It has to be described as a variation. So you don't have a variation in one of the genetic markers, it's not a marker. Okay. So you can have microsats, for example. So that means that in your reference, you have uh, some sequence with some length that uh, could be longer or shorter. And then uh, if you have primers, you can design primers, do a PCR, run agarose gels, and depending on the size, you may infer that you have sample one, sample two, or an heterocycle, depending on how many different alleles are you looking and of course, you can have SNPs markers too. And depending if you have a COIG, you may have one or another. So I said, I will not go into much detail about that. And again, you know what is a locus too. Okay. And what is a gene? So that is basic genetics. You already know that. So I don't want to spend much more time there. That was to put you in the context. The thing that is important is about sequencing. So let's start with definition, the definition about what is a DNA sequencing. And then the DNA sequencing is the process of determining the precise order of nucleotide in a DNA molecule. Okay. Include how you do that, and also the order of the four bases, adenine, guanine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine in a strand of DNA. Okay. So this is how you look at DNA in a high resolution microscope. Electronic microscope, and then this is how it will be a sequence. Keep in mind that this is an artificial, an artificial construct, okay? Adenine thymine is just a, a, a composition of the DNA. So this is the representation that we do of that composition. You want to know a little bit more about genetics and this basic stuff? You always can go to this link. Okay, so that is basics, no? What is basic about genetics and sequencing? The thing that you should know at this point. Let's go to the sequencing, how sequencing started and how have changed to what we have today. So you have two important events for sequencing. So it was first the, electro, the development of the electrophoresis or the separation of nucleic acids in the 52. And then the um, discovery or elucidation of the DNA structure in 53. The sequencing, DNA sequencing, was developed by uh, Sanger in the 77, but it wasn't until uh, six years after when a company, okay, uh, a BBIO systems, developed a, a machine that automized more of the process. Okay, so it was something like nine years until they developed a machine that was able to sequence. They improved this machine uh, six years, yeah, something like. Uh, six years, uh, and nine years after, with this capillary sequencer. And that was what was at that time, okay? Until in 2005, they developed a complete and absolute different method of sequencing that was able not to sequence uh, 10 or 100 of sequence at the same time of DNA molecules, but uh, billions or thousands of, of, of them, okay? So it was 454. For the four, of course, is obsolete, but that one year after they developed Solexa, that is called now Illumina. And in 2011 was when the long sequencing technologies started to develop. So, as I said, it's an interesting just if you are curious uh, to see um, the DNA sequencing with the chain terminating inhibitors from Sanger, the that paper of 2000, sorry, of uh, 1977. Basically, the thing that you have is you have uh, DNA molecules in solution, okay? And you use a tag polymerase to do a polymerase change reaction in which you are uh, amplifying the, the DNA molecules. In the mix, you can add not only the regular uh, DATPs, DGTPs, but also you can add the DD, uh, ATPs, DDGTPs, DDTTPs, and so on. And in solution. So when uh, the DNA polymerase is doing the amplification, it may introduce the regular DNTPs. 
or may introduce the a modified one that contains a fluorophore at the end. When it introduces the, the one that is modified, it cannot extend the change anymore and the fragments stop to grow. And of course, this occurs at random, so you, at the end you have a population of those. Then you have a chromatographic separation in time. If you read the signal, maybe because you have fluorophore for each of the modifications, you will see these peaks in the chromatogram, and then you can read the chromatogram just having the order. One important thing about terms, okay? And it's important because the language, scientific language need to be precise. You sequence DNA molecules. You don't sequence sequence, okay? And a sequence is a representation of the information, but it's not a, something physical, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a piece of information, okay? So as well as, as a read, no? So that, that is uh, an important concept. So some people sometimes confuse and use uh, we sequence, uh, yeah. So we we got the sequence. No, no. The, the sequence is a is a file with the, this representation. Okay. So the Sanger DNA sequencing systems have changed a lot since they were developed. So they starting with this 310 genetic analyzer, but then they, they improved to the this applied biosystem 3130, and then to other ones until they got kind of a more massive production, but still nothing compared with next generation sequencing. The error rate is kind of low, and then the error type that is more common is the substitution. So how is Sanjay compared with next generation sequencing? So this table more or less summarizes those. With Sanjay, you need to have this fragment amplification, as I mentioned before. Meanwhile, with next generation sequencing, DNA libraries need to be prepared. Okay, so that is the main difference. You need to prepare libraries. And depending on the methodology, the libraries are prepared in one way or another. With Sanjay, you have physical fragment separation for the detection with these chromatograms. Meanwhile, next generation sequencing detects nucleotides directly by different met methods. Sanjay produces thousands of reads. Me meanwhile, next generation sequencing produces million to billion. Now becomes something different that is. Uh, Sanjay produced between 400 and 900 base pair reads, and next generation sequencing produced short and long reads. We can say that short is at the first generation of the sequencer, and long will be second and third. Then you can have a variable error rate for next generation sequencing. Meanwhile, Sanjay has a low, very, very low error rate. And finally, because you don't produce many, Sanjay can be used for semi competitive so semi uh, comparisons. Meanwhile, Next generation sequence is only for quantitative comparisons. Okay. This summarizes more or less the technologies that we've had today. How long is the risk that you can produce? Accuracy, risk per run, time per run, and cost per megabase. So right now we have Sanjay, as I mentioned before. This is the additional one. Then we have 454 that is obsolete and is, was discontinued several years ago, so cannot be used anymore because the cost per megabase was very expensive. Then you have Illumina. You have Illumina in different fashions and different ways. And the length usually goes from uh, 75 base per to 250, or even 300 you are using a MySeq. 1% of error rate and produce billions of, of rates okay, per run in most of the cases. So they are very cheap, you think, in cost per megabase. Then you have Solid. That was kind of an attempt trying to do uh, something similar to Illumina. That produce very short reads, but uh, their rate is very low too. Sometimes people use the, all those, still use those for um, SNP callings, okay, but not it's not common anymore. And then I am Torrent was kind of a, a attempt to do something cheap that was able to compete with uh, Illumina MySeq. Still, it's not so cheap, and then you have a higher error rate and the amount of, of reads that you produce. So that is not as much. And of course, the cost per megabase is much higher than Illumina. So again, Ion Torrent is not being used anymore. Then for the long read sequencing technologies, you have Pacific Bioscience and Oxford Nanopore. And their rates can be very high, but then because you can have several passes, you can reduce the amount of uh, error. So let's summarize a little bit, and as I said, this is going to be a very fast uh, 
walking through uh, the different technologies. Uh, also talking about different types of libraries. So the first thing that you need to know is the library type. And this library type that you can see here can be applied only for short read sequencing technologies. OK, when you have your long uh, short read sequencing technologies, you are sequencing fragments. You are sequencing the streams of a DNA fragment. So you can sequence one stream only. So you are sequence is the thing that we call single reads. Or you can sequence both, both, both streams. So this is the thing that you will have here that is parents. OK. So parents can be uh, insert size between 150 and 800. So if you sequence those, of course, you are only sequencing the stream, so you may don't know what is inside. Remember that uh, Illumina, for example, can sequence up to 300 base pairs per read. OK, so it means that, for example, well, it's common. It's more common to do it 150. No? So if you are sequencing 150 in this example, you will have 150 here, 150 here. If the fragment size is 800, you will have 500 base pairs in the middle that you will not know. But still, you don't. You know that this read and this read is connected. Of course, there are other technologies to jump. Not this. Depending on how you prepare the libraries, the maximum size of the insert could be 800. But there are other ways that you can use to prepare even bigger sizes, up to 40 kb even. Um, although this is difficult. Why the map pairs information is useful is mostly when you are doing um, genome assemblies. For transcriptons can be also very useful if you are working with alternative splicing and you need to know what exons go together. OK, but uh, in, but it's more important for genome assemblies. And the reason is because when you have reads and you are doing a genome assembly or a sequence assembly, let's say a sequence assembly, the first step is that once you have all the reads together, you call a consensus. You have per render information. You can map the reads back to your consensus and you know that this consensus and this consensus are connected by several pairs. You can put this consensus together, even if you don't know what is in the middle, and call this a scaffold. And of course, when you are doing genome assemblies and there are big ones, you also can use other information to produce to increase the, the, the size of this scaffold, for example, using genetic markers. OK. That is not important because you are talking about transcriptom, but we are we are talking about transcriptom is essential the concept of multiplexing. So what is a multiplexing? Well, this new next generation sequencing technologies produce a huge amount of sequence. And of course, when you have this huge amount of sequences, that costs you money. So maybe one round of these Illumina machines cost, cost you two thousand dollars. Of course, you don't want to dedicate just one single lane of these machines, one single run of these machines just to the same sample, because that would be a waste of money. So the thing that you do is you do the multiplexing. And a multiplexing means that you attach a tag that you know to each of your samples during the library operation. When you have your cDNA or your library that you want to uh, sequence, you mix all of them equal monody, and then you put them in the sequencer. And because you have this tag, you are able to identify what are the source of these reads. So that will be the example here. So imagine that you have sample one and sample two, you start the mRNA, and during the library preparation, and to the sample one, you put that the tag ATGC, and for the sample two, you put the tag CGAG. You prepare the cDNA, and it means that these tags have been attached to the cDNA when you are doing the synthesis, and then you pull them, and then you put them in the sequencer. When you get the, the reads from the sequencer, just reading these streams, you are able to know, just looking into this tag, if they come from sample one or you come from sample two. From a practical point of view, most of the sequencers, I mean, most of the sequencing company, they do the, the multiplexing for you, so you don't need to be worried about that. But in all times, we needed to run several programs to perform the, the multiplexing in order to identify the origin of the samples. OK, sequencing systems. So now that you know a little bit about libraries. Sequencing systems. So the first one that appears in 2005 was 454. They used this pure sequencing technology. I'm not going to go into much into that. And the reason is that, that in 2013, it was discontinued. 
I remember that uh, some of my collaborators in some, some universities is about one of these uh, um, Roach uh, 454 sequencers. And it was very expensive at the time. And of course, I don't know, the, 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 life, the lifespan of this sequencer was something like four or five years. And then the company get this shut down because they were not able to keep uh, and maintaining the business the same and the same rate that uh, Solexa. Okay, so Solexa in Lumina, let's say that this is 90, 95 percent per, per of the of the market of the sequencing market. Okay, and um, basically they use this sequencing by synthesis technology, um, in which this means is that you have your DNA. Mostly the thing that you have is you have your DNA. And when you are preparing this, the sample, the libraries, you, the thing that you do is you attach some adapters to them. Okay, adapters that are well known. Once you are doing the sequencing, so this is library preparation. Once you are doing the sequencing, you attach these DNA molecules with these adapters to a surface, a nano surface. Once you have that, then you do the thing that is called a bleach amplification. So is you amplify each of these spots, okay? You may have only just one molecule for each of, each of the spots, and one molecule is not enough to give you enough signal. So you need to increase the density. So what they think that you do is you do a cycle of amplification. So it's being used this thing that is called bridge amplification, okay? So once you have the bridge amplification, you will start to have clusters. When you have the clusters, mostly, the thing that this methodology is about is you have some reactions in which every time that you incorporate a nucleotide, a fluorescent signal is produced. So you have these, well, these nanocrystals with a lot of different dots. Each of these dots represents a DNA population. And when these reactions are being produced, each of these dots that is a population produce a light signal. Depending if the light signal is red or yellow or blue, depending on the fluorophore, you know that you are incorporating in each of the cycles a different thing. So you capture the images and then you escalate the images one after another until you reconstruct the sequence. So imagine that this will work in this way. No? So you have a first round, and in the first round, you have these dots that is green producing a, well, this dot that is a yellow producing a G. And then in the second cycle, the same dot is producing a C because it's blue. And then in the third cycle, it's producing a green signal that means T. And the fourth cycle is producing a G, a yellow signal, this is a G. And then for five cycles, an, an A that is red. Once you put all these images after another, you can go on to these coordinates and start the sequence. So in this case, the sequence will be something like G, C, T, G, A. Okay, so this is how these things work. The signal is important because the signal is always not perfect. So depending how good was the signal, the nucleotide that you are reading in your read, that you have in your sequence, it may have some, the thing that we call a Q-score. Higher that is the Q-score, more sure that you are, that the light signal was the one that you wanted, was clear, and more reliable is going to be the nucleotide that you are calling. Okay, so that is an, an important part here too. If you want to see a video, I would recommend to go and click here and you will see a video about the sequencing itself, okay? But that is more as how it works. The other thing that is important now, and again, now the sequences facilities uh, use, uh, handle these things for you, so you don't need to be worried, but uh, is in which machine you are going to sequence. So there are two types of two types of Illumina machines. One of them are the bench shot top systems that are made for small uh, sequencing volumes. And then you have this production scale system that are can produce a huge amount of data. So you have this mini SIG system or my SIG or NextSIG, or you have in the production scale from NextSec to the NovaSec 6000. The NovaSec 6000 is produced so much data that produce something like 6,000 gigs per run. So means around 20 billions of reads. In other words, you can sequence around, uh, yeah, you can sequence around uh, 2,000 times one human genome per run. 
okay? So things have changed a lot. Okay, so that is in nomina. It's the thing that you need to keep in mind. Important, keep in mind the idea of, of how the libraries are prepared and ready, but nothing else. Then uh, we have this other system that is solid, that uh, works with the technology that is sequenced by ligation technology. And I will not explain the details of that. I will leave that to you if you are curious. But again, this is a sequencing technology that is going to be obsolete or is being obsolete now. That's mostly the thing that I can tell you is that at some point you have some signal. And this signal can be interpreted in two different ways. So the, the good thing is that it can be really accurate. So they are uh, were able even to reach 99.99% of accuracy, just calling the nucleotides, but still they have some technical difficulties just to read what uh, base do you have. I'm not going to go into much of that. Just keep in mind that this is kind of obsolete. This is uh, the stats about how they've been produced. No? Uh, and as, again, they have this limitation that the bigger sequence that they can produce is something like 75 based. You may think, well, if still I want to call SNPs, should be fine. I want to call some variants, will be fine. The problem is that shorter that is your read, more difficulties that you want to have doing the mapping. We will solve that thing later. So maybe too short is not good either. Again, you have this uh, video if you are interested. And let me go to the last of the short read systems that is this Ion Terrain. Ion Terrain produce, put, put some effort to time to produce a cool machine. Like, I don't know if it looks like a sequencer or a kitchen, uh, yeah, a kitchen system no? to do something. This looks more like that. Um, so they use this sequence by semiconductor technology. And again, I'm not going to go into much into that, but the problem of this technology is that, uh, and as I said, this is the summary about the, the process, okay? The problem of that technology is that it's not very reliable. So at some point, the error rate is high. So even it can produce length of the, a similar, rate of a similar length than um, Illumina, the error rate is higher, it's twice the error rate of Illumina. So at the end, it's more expensive, higher error rate, but at the end, you don't use it. Okay, so that is short read sequencing technology. Question that you have for this part, meanwhile, I'm drinking some water because I'm starting to have to be live. Question that you may have. By the way, thanks to just uh, write your uh, presence in the chat. Are you there? Are you caffeinated? I hope that you are drinking coffee. I think that maybe these things, well, because we are well, we are not in quarantine anymore, and this is an online class, but maybe in one or different uh, time, we should ask something like uh, the PhD school to do these things kind of uh, in, a, in a cafeteria or something like that, in a more relaxed way. That would be nicer. Okay, so let me move now to the long read sequencing technologies. Um, there are mostly, mostly two systems. One is a big machine that produces, I'm very interested in, uh, Product that is uh, this Pac Bio, okay, Pacific Bio System. This is a big machine, and they use this single molecule real time technology. So mostly the thing that they have is you have a small nano walls in a plate, and at the bottom of the nano wall you have a protein that is producing a polymerization, and every time that is producing a polymerization is producing a luminic signal that is captured what is under this wall. And this is a, a life process. So once this molecule, once this protein is incorporating this nucleotide, so this is the signal that is read by some detector uh, at, in, in a live time. So it's why I say that it's a real time, because you can know the sequence of uh, the DNA molecules that you are reading yeah, in a real time. So it produce, so during the, the level preparation has some specific uh, insights. So you have this uh, double DNA coiling, and I'm not going to go into too much that. The only thing that I can tell you is that when you are sequencing this, you can read in a circular way. So you can pass one and again and again. So you can read these DNA molecules several times. And that is important 
because every time that you read the DNA molecule, you and you pass through a nucleotide, if you read that same nucleotide twice, three times, four times, you reduce the error rate a lot. Okay. Okay. So how much can this machine produce? Well, it depends. No, they are, have produced. I didn't up here, but they have a new system that is high D, high C, high C. Um, but the old system that is this uh, uh, RS2 smart cells can produce around 50,000 sequences per cell with an average length of 10 kb, so it's very high, and an average to red length after that you need the adapters for 7 kb. This is an average, so, so the thing that about Illumina is that always produce the same amount, so the same size, but this depends on the efficiency of the amplification. So sometimes the rates are going to be longer, or sometimes they're going to be smaller. But sometimes even you can have 30, 40 kb rates. Okay. That was cool. But what for me was a game changer and, and was really a game changer was when they developed uh, Oxford Nanopore. Because you can, this is you have this pen life or kind of a pen life uh, system in which you can really sequence DNA. So it's very portable. And the difference is that this machine that you can see here costs around almost around 1 million of euros. And this costs 1,000. So as you can imagine, there are some big differences. Still, this machine, their rate is higher. But come on, it's 1,000. So for some labs, still is doable. And this is a very interesting concept because it's based in nanopores. So you have a nanopore, in this case it's a protein, and it's a protein that when a, a DNA molecule grows through the pore, it produces some differences in the electric currency. So, and you can measure these electric currency differences. So it means that when a DNA molecule is passing through the pore, and at this point you uh, adenine is passing, you may have some signal. But when it's passing a teaming, you would may have a different signal. It's also a real time lecture, so you can read the ATGC, the nucleotides, in a real time. But the other thing that is really cool of this technology and still is improving is that it can detect not only nucleotides, but also modified nucleotides too. So you are looking for some methylations in the DNA if you have the right setup after that you do the reading you are able to detect them. And that is great because uh, regular, regularly when you are trying to detect uh, epigenetic modifications like, like uh, methylations, you need to do some specific uh, chemical treatment before the sequencing that have produced some biases. But in this case, you are reading, you have a, a teaming, for example, all of these teamings have some methylene. So it's, I think that is very cool. So you have different, uh, Type. So the units more or less is this uh, cell, and you can have a system that can have one cell, or you can have a system that has several cells. A cells can produce up to 600,000 um, reads. Also depends on of, of the pore, because if you have contaminations, you are, have not a very pure solution. The pores get upset at some point and doesn't work anymore. And the, the cool thing also is that uh, can produce uh, the sequence length, it depends. But I know that even in some labs, they do some competitions and they reach sequence length of one megabase even. Okay, so that's it. again amazing. When this technology started, that was uh, in 2015, their rate was really high, it was 40%. 40% was really, really high. But with time, they have been improving a lot to the point that in 2000, I think that was 2016, no, 2018 or 17, the first uh, plant genome was produced just with Oxford nanopore. The quality was okay. Okay, so so they improved their rate a lot. Okay, so that is for long read sequencing technologies. Questions that you may have about long read sequencing technologies. So, um, you hear me? Yeah. Um, my question would be, um, 
are the long and short sequencing te technologies for different types of uh, research? Uh, I mean, why would I choose a short or long one? Uh, well, depending on your study, depending on what do you want to go to. And indeed, I will put the example with transcriptome. So, yeah, yeah. So, I will do some example with transcriptome soon. And depending, so when you are doing genome sequencing, the whole genome sequencing, long reads is the way to go. But then you need to complement with short reads to correct the errors. So, it's a hybrid approach. But then, depending on uh, RNA seq, it depends. Sometimes you need to have short reads, sometimes you need to have long reads. Depends. I will explain that thing later. Any other question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. If not, uh, let me move to the next. So, from the sequence side, you get uh, the sequence in some specific format. And let me summarize what are the most common format for genomics. Okay. So, and you will be doing some exercise with those. So, that is going to be uh, important. So, here is the important point of this lesson. First is you have the FASTA format. The FASTA format is a text-based file format that stores three types of sequences. So you can have DNA, RNA, or protein sequences. Okay. It can represent it, you use this to represent uh, information of sequencing for genomes, mRNA, cDNA, whatever. No, you can as soon as you have a sequence, you can represent those with that. So how the format works is you always have a greater than that defines the beginning of a sequence, and the beginning of the sequence is greater than and then a sequence ID. This sequence ID can be repeated. It's recommended some programs is going to fail if they're not unique, but yeah, but still not, nothing forced that they can be the same or not. Then you have a space. And then you may have some optional description if you want, or something else. The important thing is that when you find the first line, and you always have one line per greater than, per read or sequence, you have the sequence lines. And the sequence line can be one sequence line or can be more, depending. Okay? Again, nothing for that. Once the first sequence finished, you can start another sequence with, again, another greater than, sequence ID, space, and then uh, description and again sequence and so on. Okay, so again one greater than per uh, description. FASTQ is a more complex format because not only store not only the sequence, okay, but also the quality associated to each of the nucleotides. Remember that when you are calling nucleotides in a sequencer, depending on how good was the signal, you can associate a Q score, a quality score. If the signal was not good, the quality score will be low. If the signal was good, the quality score will be high. So you want to keep those. So a fast Q is a sequence that starts with greater than, sorry, with uh, at that symbol. Then the sequence ID. You may have a space and something else or not, depending. And then you have the sequence. So with that works very similar to faster. Instead, greater than you have at. But then you have a plus. And plus define everything that comes after is going to be quality. And then you have quality that has uh, as many characters for the quality as nucleotides that you have in the previous line. So quality, you have different characters, and each of the characters represent a number. And this number, higher than this number, higher is going to be the quality. So what numbers means this? Well, depending, they have been changing this format for a while. The last one that has been stable for almost eight years is this Illumina 1.8. And you have this table. So this go, the, the values go from 33 to 74. So to calculate the quality, you go to the character that you are looking for, and then you check the number. Then you subtract 33, and then you can go to this flat table and will give you some idea of how it. So for example, here you have an A at the beginning, so you will go here. A is 64, 65. So 65 will be A. So 65 will be A. You remove, you subtract from 65, 
33, you have 32. So the quality score for the first move of that will be 32. So in this case, it will be 32, 32, 32, 32, 32, and then F. And F go will go to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it will be 70. So 70 is you should start 33, you will have 37. So 37 will be for the X and so on. So you can translate that. And of course, you have automatic programs that will do that for you. The thing that's important is when you have these numbers, what do they mean? And they mean what is the minimum, the, 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 the probability that you have that this is a, a false positive code. So depending on the sequencing technology, you use some, some numbers. So when you are using 454, you use 20. When everything that is below 20 is something that you discard. When you are using well, Illumina now is 30. So, so 30 means one uh, error in 1,000. Okay, so this is the error rate, so it will be one in 1,000 false positives. But this still is a doable number. The other thing that you need to keep in mind here is that we usually will move every, every nucleotide that is below 30 for Illumina. For PacBio, we don't perform this kind of things because the quality is already low, so we need to correct them with the different methods. The last uh, format, and you will see that in the read mapping, is the sum bound file. SAM, and BAN is a binary format for SAM, is a format designated to store read mapping, okay? They are not storing sequences, but they are storing the mapping of those to a reference. It has 11 columns, as you can see here, and of course, they tell you different things. So the first column is the sequence ID, so the, the read ID. The second tells you uh, about the, some flags about how was the mapping. The third one is the reference name, the fourth one will be the position in the reference in which this sequence is mapping. The last one, the red one, that is the five, is the mapping quality. So if it's 30, 20 or more, it's good. And this works more or less in the same way than the quality with um, the, the, the nucleotide calling. Then you will have a cigar line that tells you how is the alignment. So in this case, is eight match, two inserts, four match, one deletion, three matches, so that will be this one. The second one is free uh, soft clifting, so that's uh, this one. Then soft clifting means that you don't take into account for the alignment, okay? Is why they have lower case here. Six matches, this one. Uh, one, three, I don't remember what was. I need to check, no. Yeah, well one insertion, and then four matches, and so on. So this is, as I said, it's kind of, uh, will be uh, this format. Then you have, if some information ready with the pairs you have, and then finally you have quality, uh, the sequence and the quality. Again, sum and bam summarize where the sequence, the read maps to our reference, okay? And here, some explanation about the flag. So depending on the flag, it's telling you if the read of the segment is mapped or unmapped. So if the flag four is activated, means that the read has not been mapped because these this, uh, files store all the reads. The reads that can be mapped and the, the read that has not been mapped too. So you need to have these flags in order to know how that. Okay. Another, the last format that is common is this GFF free, that is a text a uh, basic file with nine columns designing to store genomic features. So mostly the thing that these files tell you is you have a sequence of a genome, which part of that sequence contains genes or other elements, exons, transposons, and yeah, promoter boxes. So all these things are elements. So this GFA file is going to store them. No? So this is an example telling that this part of the genome is an mRNA. So you can see this first line. And then you have five exons that you can see here that will be equivalent to these ones. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, I forget. The BCF file, and we will not see a BCF file during this uh, workshop, told you about variants. Okay, so you have variants, like because you have a, a population. BCF files will tell you about these variants. Okay, 
So that is common file formats. Question that you may have about these common file formats. Okay, so let me finish with some things about transcriptome sequencing, and we will see some of them in more depth in the experimental design. So, transcriptome first is to define what is a transcriptome. No, it's about what this is this class, or what is about the transcriptome. So, transcriptome is the set of genes transcribed in a specific moment. So, it's a temporal thing. You cannot talk about the transcriptome of a plant. Okay. You can talk about the genome of, of a species of, of an individual, but you cannot talk about the transcriptome of an individual. You need to talk about the transcriptome of an individual in some specific tissue, in some specific conditions, under some specific time. Okay, so because you are talking about expression. So in some ways, also can be defined as the transcribed genome for a specific cell type, tissue of some specific developmental stage, under some specific conditions. And it, that produces that you have some important differences with a genome. So if you have a sample and you start the genome, all the molecules of the DNA that you are sequenced more or less should be equally represented, especially for the nuclear genome. So you have a fragmentation of the nuclear genome, more or less each of the fragments should represent equally. Meanwhile, when you have a transcriptome, because you have some, some molecules, so RNA, some genes are more expressed than others, the genes that are more expressed than others will produce more mRNA molecules, and then you will have more of them in the, in the sequencing. Okay, so some molecules should be more abundant than others. So this make a major difference about how you deal with this, this information. Okay, one of them is independent of the state, the other is associated to the state in terms of populations and distributions. Commonly, we don't talk about Transcriptome as a general thing, but the experiment that we perform usually is called RNA seq. But mainly, mostly the thing that you want to say is RNA sequencing. Okay. So again, it's used next generation sequencing to reveal the presence and the quality of RNA in a biological sample. Now that will summarize in some ways this process, in which you have a DNA in the, in the genome and this is transcribed in mature mRNA. So then you prepare a library, so you sequence, you, you fragment this and then you sequence that. And once you have the sequence, you process the sequence and tend to get some information, okay? So RNA seq experiment will be all of this. RNA seq studies have several functions, okay? You can uh, analyze different populations of RNA, just to look for RNA, mRNA, long non coding RNA, small RNA, like microRNA, so on. Because you can study different type of RNA. Also, it can be analyzed in different moments. So you can analyze at the end of the transcription, but also you can analyze during the transcription using a ribosomal profiling. Ribosomal profiling is a modification of RNA sequencing in which you stop the RNA while it's being transcribed by the ribosome. So you can really know where the ribosome is stopping much more time when it's transcribing the molecule. It's a very cool technique. Also, you can analyze different uh, forms, like alternative splicings. And analysis can be qualitative. You look for presence or absence of something, or can be quantitative if you want to measure the amounts of, of transcripts. Okay, that's an important difference too. Libraries has, are tricky, so I, and we will see that in the experimental design. But also, when you are preparing an RNA seq library, you have important difference with that DNA seq library. First is the RNA need to be isolated, okay? And also, when you are isolating, this RNA population depends on when, when was extracted, and also how you are extracted. If for some reason your RNA is affected in their integrity, uh, small molecules, small mRNA molecules are going to disappear, so you will produce a, a, a a variation, a modification, and bias in the scene that you are sequencing. So that is a major difference. With genomes, more or less everything is stable. You don't need to be worried about that. Um, other thing that happens is that the molecules of interest need to be depleted or selected. So, so for example, you are working only with mRNA, 
you may use the poly A to just amplify only the mRNA, or you may deplete removing air RNA and tRNA just uh, by precipitation by, with some probes, depending on the depletion method. And also, other important thing is that DNA can be sequenced as it is, but in most of the cases, mRNA need to be transformed in cDNA before it's sequenced. Okay. And not all the fragments that you have, okay, not all the fragments are going to uh, be transcribed or retrotranscribed with the same efficiency. Some of them are going to be more efficient than others. Okay, so that is another important point. Nowadays, there are two technologies, some technologies. Uh, one, one, one of them is, yeah, again, it's a business that uh, disappeared several years ago. But the one that is still there is Oxford Nanopore. So Oxford Nanopore, in theory, can sequence RNA. And it's doing that, although the error rate is very high. But you can sequence the RNA molecule directly without transforming cDNA with uh, Oxford Nanopore. OK, so that is uh, for uh, this lesson. Questions that you may have about this lesson? Uh, yes, uh, the error rate of Oxford nanopore is uh, less uh, from uh, BS's uh, inserted uh, with the retrotranscription from mRNA to cDNA. Um, so Sorry for the English. <laughs> No, it's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. My Italian is much worse than your English, so <laughs> it's fine. Uh, that would be uh, so. Um, depends. So the error rate. Uh, no, the error rate is not. Is not. Um, the error rate is not going to be lower. So, so the error rate of trans of transcribing of transforming the mRNA into cDNA and then sequencing with osphoranopolis is going to be lower. But then you have some advantages. And one of them is we know now that uh, the nucleotides of the RNA can be modified too. And of course, that information is something that you, you completely lost when you do the retrotranscription. So still there are some, some, some labs and some researchers that they still work with that, not trying to understand the modifications in, R, in the RNA. That is one of the things. The other is uh, that even if the error rate is lower when you retrotranscribe, the efficiency of retrotranscription is going to be uh, different depending on the molecule. So when you are just sequencing the RNA without retrotranscribe them, you have a more accurate uh, measure of the abundance of the mRNA. So even if you have errors in the sequence, you maybe you don't care. You are really want to measure the RNA without uh, any bias or minimizing the bias. So for example, that would be you are working with Arabidopsis. You don't care if the sequencing is giving you errors. You are just want to count how many molecules do you have in your experiment. Thanks a lot. Very clear. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, related to this one, um, are uh, long uh, non-coding RNAs, for example, sequenced uh, by next uh, generation sequencing, or uh, it is better to use uh, Oxford nanopore, for example, in this case? Uh, well, next generation sequencing is everything. Uh, oh. So no, next generation sequencing is everything. Um, no, long long coding RNA can be sequenced by any any of these methods. So, okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, long long coding uh, RNA is uh, yeah can be sequenced can be read over the and then sequenced on that of measure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Have a it's more like a curiosity. Um, the common uh, file output format, are they interchangeable? I mean, if you get uh, something like uh, in a format, you can change it in a, into another format easily, or it is a mess? Uh, 
No, yes, no, indeed. The format that I told you is so fast, uh, fast queue uh, BAM files are very easy to interpret if exchange between them. Very, very easy. So, in terms of sequencing, changing from, uh, from one format to another is easy. Changing formats, for example, when you are working with population genetics, is something more complex. When you are trying to have, for example, some link format or then some hat map format and you have a BCF file, that can be a real nightmare. But in sequencing, just sequencing and mapping, no, no, everything is quite standard. So move from faster to fast queue or from fast queue to faster is a step forward, it's one command. Okay, thank you. For transcriptome sequencing, is better to use um, single ends or parents sequencing? I will answer that question uh, in the experimental design. I hear my echo, but yeah, uh, depending. It depends. It depends. So the, the, the short answer is it depends. The long answer is you will see in the next class. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so I uh, can see some something in the chat. So let me see if we have uh, other questions. Well, no, I don't see any other questions. Okay, um, so next class uh, will be. So next class, yeah. I'm not sure if this is the one that uh, tell, okay. So I'm going to move to, to the uh, RNA-6 experimental design analysis. I'm not sure if, let me see if this is an introduction. Okay. So yeah, we will talk about uh, yeah, RNS experimental design analysis. So let me. Uh, so I'm going to give you a break of uh, ten minutes. Okay, because for me, I'm sorry. It's, when I talk the whole day, I need uh, some some uh, break. So you have a break of ten minutes, and then I will uh, come back. Uh, to the RNS experimental design and analysis. Okay, so uh, we come back at um, 15. Um, yeah, the other thing is uh, this the next class is going to be important because even at some point you are not going to do the analysis, next class is going to tell you about the experimental design. So I really recommend to attend the next class, okay? Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm going to stop videos, recordings, and so on. And I will activate everything